Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Canole, and welcome back once again to another edition of the Movie Battleground. Today, we have an exciting matchup, and we have something that we haven't had in a while. We have some rookies. We have some guys who, while they're not necessarily new to uh, anything in the community, they are new to Battleground, or at least to regular Battleground for one of the guys. Uh, we have Ryan Payne, who has already played in two exhibitions of the new era of Battleground, but he does have experience from before. He will be taking on Alex Martinez, who, if you guys are in the geek space specifically, you guys definitely know Alex. Uh, he runs in the circle of all the best players and yet still manages to hold his own, which is impressive enough because goddamn does he know how to keep some company. Uh, but he is here stepping into the world of debate, which uh, a friend of his has done well in before. So we're not going to waste any time and get into it. Uh, introducing first, as I was just speaking about him, making his debut, he is Alex Martinez. Alex, welcome to the Battleground. Uh, good to be here. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, man, you, you keep some impressive company on our compatriot uh, TM Geek specifically. You know, you have uh, you got Joe in your corner. You got David in your corner, both of whom are top competitors, both of whom have played here before. And uh, specifically, Joe being an ex-champion, you got some uh, you got some strength in your corner here. So uh, how, how, does that play into any confidence for you coming into this or is this just taking it kind of as it goes? Um, well, confidence, my confidence anyway, comes from preparation uh, and uh, this is something that I, I make. I'm a critical overthinker. Uh, that's why Joe is always so prepared. That is why David is so prepared. That's why anyone that I manage is always so prepared is because uh, pretty much from the time that I'm awake, I'm thinking about movies and the content they're in. Um, so we'll see if it uh, helps at all. Probably. Who knows? I'm, I'm sure it'll help at some point in some way. Uh, and I mean, obviously, this is a bit of a friendly debut for you because you're taking on Ryan. So what are your thoughts on him as a competitor? Uh, I love Ryan as a competitor. He's been one of my favorites for a very long time. Ryan gave me my first loss uh, as a player in Geek. It was my second ever match, and I ran into uh, one hell of a player. I got that win back uh, this year in uh, fandom teams. Uh, so this is the rubber match. Uh, uh, and very recently, some people know about this. Ryan and I have teamed up to take on the TM, uh, the TM Geek's Geek Teams tournament. Uh, so this is just uh, a once and for all kind of thing. Whoever takes it, takes it. It doesn't matter at all. Well, I'm happy to have it hosted here. Uh, I'm also in the TM Geek thing. I expect to be losing very soon to Joe and David. So, you know, it all crosses over. It'll happen. Uh, so I'll go ahead. <laughs> Let's just be real here. I'm, I'm a realist when it comes to my abilities. So we'll sit you in the back and bring in your opponent. Also making his official debut after appearing in a couple of our exhibitions. He is... The Caramel Mountain, Ryan Payne. Welcome to the Battleground, sir. How you doing? I'm good, uh, Aaron. Yeah, um, it's nice to, you know, make, like, an official, you know, debut. I mean, yeah, those were exhibition matches. But even then, this is something that's going to be very interesting. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess similar question to you. I mean, uh, you yourself are, are a top geek player who Alex keeps the company of. I mean, you guys are friends. You're here uh, for uh, some behind-the-scenes info. This match got set up. Uh, for those of you who remember the DC match, uh, Alex was a judge. Ryan was a competitor. I offered Ryan a chance to debut. I said I'd give it to him when I got somebody to play against him, and Alex just kind of straight up volunteered then and there. So it's been friendly from the jump. Uh, so how are you feeling going into it? Well, I mean – I'm being even killed trying to be as a uh, center as possible um, from like from my scene from my exhibition matches. I mean, normally when I like to, you know, present myself, I mean, yeah, I'd like to prep, but then also I always want to make sure when I'm, uh, if I learn anything from my exhibition, I got to make sure I get my uh, store. My, I got to make sure I get my points straight. So one thing I'm going to be sure, yes, this is going to be a fun match, but uh, I'm going to do my best to remain even keel as possible, not let the time, you know, really, really like, tried to hammer me down. Yeah, that's a great approach to it, man. I'm going to go ahead and bring Alex in, and we will go ahead and get started. Movie Battleground is a game that is the best of five rounds. It is a first to three points wins. Each round of debate is going to be worth one point for these gentlemen. If we happen to have a competitor score three points in a row, that'll be a victory by knockout, and we'll all get to go home a little early. However, if it is a 2-2 draw at the end of the four rounds, we do have a fifth round. It is called the blind round. We'll deal with that should we have to, although for their sake, they probably don't want to. Uh, with that said, though, in terms of the regulation rounds, they have four questions on the table. They were given them ahead of time to prep and prepare for 
Uh, that's the same exact thing. I don't know why I said that twice. Uh, they are going to get 60 seconds to open up their argument. That will be followed by a two-minute chance to kind of expand or rebut whatever they choose to do. There will be a four-minute open discussion period where they'll trade blows back and forth and try and get some points in on each other, and then a 60-second closing argument to surmise their points. Behind the scenes, we have three judges in Brian, Malcolm, and Stacy. They are listening. They are taking notes or whatever helps them judge. They will be on screen of when you guys are finished, and they, based on what was said in the argument, they will make their deliberation on who gets the point. With all that said, are you guys have any questions for me? Or are you ready to go? I'll lead out clear. All right. So we'll go ahead and get into it. And there's no better way to get this started uh, than by giving you guys a question that limits you, uh, because this is a replay question. For those of you guys who are new to Battleground, a replay question is a question that has previously been asked before. Uh, sometimes it's a main game question. Sometimes it's a blind round question. But it basically is... I deem that there are still enough viable answers to this question that we can replay it. And I mean, there is no actor who I feel has been praised more for his work in the 90s than Tom Hanks. And uh, there's definitely a multitude of options. So we are replaying what is the best Tom Hanks movie of the 1990s. Now, for those of you who may not remember, uh, this is a replay question. It was previously used between myself and Jay Burns. If you haven't seen that, that was an interesting one. Uh, but he chose Forrest Gump and I chose Toy Story. Thus, they were deemed unavailable for the competitors here today. However, they had the rest of Hank's filmography to pick from, and they picked some good ones and not the obvious one that's left on the table. I know you all know what movie that you're thinking of, and that is not the one that they picked. Uh, but with that said, we're going to go ahead and get into I mean, We all know, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. Uh, it's the Green Mile, obviously. Uh, Ryan, because you've played exhibitions previously, that was what was giving you the slight edge to be deemed the favorite today. Uh, you chose to go first on questions one and three. Alex, you'll get to go first on two and four. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in the timer for you uh, when it sets to load. There it is. And you will begin, uh, the timer will begin ticking once you begin speaking. So if you need just to take a second to collect your thoughts, that's absolutely fine. And because this is your first time, guys, I want to give you an extra best of luck on this, Ryan, when you're ready. Given Tom Hanks' filmography, it really is a hard choice to decide what is his best performance. But for my choice, I decided to pick something that is that it still encapsulates on how good he is of an actor today, and that is his performance in A League of Their Own, playing the uh, playing the baseball manager of the Rockford Peaches, Jimmy. What makes this performance very good was that this is one of the few roles Tom Hanks plays where he is sort of unlike, where he's unlikable, and you can almost say despicable, not like in the uh, like in a classic villain sense, but kind of despicable in his action. Because when you meet his character, Jimmy, he is a drunk. He wants nothing to do with women's baseball. All he cares about is getting back to the big time. He doesn't give no thoughts of working with these ladies until he they have to earn his respect. And despite this being probably given the best quote, there is no crying in baseball. Tom Hanks' performance shows of a man who's down on his luck, gets an opportunity, doesn't make doesn't take advantage of it, but then later on decides to go decides to just go with it, and you see him become a little better towards the end. That's my time and time. All right, Alex, back over to you for your first minute, sir. Right. So the problem is uh, with this question is that it's very difficult to uh, parse what it means. Uh, are we talking about the best Tom Hanks performance of the 90s? That's not specified. Or the best movie in general with Tom Hanks in it? Uh, again, not specified. So I'm going to argue both, uh, if I can. Uh, Tom Hanks is a supporting player in both. It's actually fairly comparable between the two. However, I will argue that Tom Hanks is not the point of a League of Their Own. He is, in fact, the point of Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia, of course, being one of the first actually open movies to talk about uh, homosexuality, uh, the AIDS epidemic, uh, general uh, attitudes of sexuality. A League of Their Own is a fantastic film. I really enjoyed watching it, first time watch for me, but it is a light romp. Uh, most of the problems are solved, neat bow. Uh, Philadelphia is complicated. It is uh, honestly kind of horrifying uh, the way uh, people are treated in that film, and not just in a three-act structure kind of way, in a way that once it's over, those problems still exist, uh, unlike Tom Hanks' drinking problem in A League of Their Own. Time. All right. And that will be time on the opening. 
uh, absolutely. You guys can read this any way you like. It's just about who brings the best argument. So if you want to go for everything and everything, I applaud you. Ryan, back over to you, sir, when you begin speaking. Now, it is there is valid argument to say that Tom Hanks is only supporting character in League of Their Own while he is a lead and he carries the film in Philadelphia. But when it comes to performance alone, if this was something about Tom Hanks' best performance as a lead, then League of Their Own would be disqualified. But as a supporting character, he is still someone who is driving the story. Sure, the whole movie is focused on this on the whole of women's baseball and them trying to get moving forward. But as a coach, it is his job to make sure that these women are able to play professionally, that they can be seen as professional players. And because the fact, because of his drunkenness, he is not just stumbling, he does nothing to help these ladies. He doesn't give them advice. He doesn't coach them. It's not until Gina Davis's character Dottie steps up to the plate, he realizes he needs to step up. And because of his attitude, because of him being drunk, it shows that he's not the kind of person he should be, especially his motivation is to get to back into the majors, either as a player, as a coach, or as a trainer. I mean, his, his main role is to get back to the big show. His growth here is to realize that he sees is to understand the value of women's ba baseball here. And at the end of the film, sure, it's alluded that his drunk, that his drinking has been um, fixed. But in all honesty, it's just that he's found something better to hold to, which is being a coach for women's baseball in Philadelphia. It is a very hard. It, it's a really hard story to come across. And Tom Hanks playing somebody who is, who has the AIDS virus and is homosexual. It is definitely a, a it's definitely a performance where the cards are placed against him, and Tom has to be without a doubt one of the like shining lights of it. That all the positives, but then at the same time, it's because it's his story. You can't leave a lot of room for his character to come off looking unlikable or making many mistakes. Otherwise, it would not be. Uh, I mean, it, it's not an uplifting story, but you wouldn't want the ending to be a little uplifting for having him and Denzel Washington's character change and also for the outcome of the courts and uh, uh, for the outcome of the case to come off on a positive light. I will end my time. All right, Alex, back over to you, sir, for two minutes when you're ready. Right, so the issue that we're having here is that we're trying to figure out uh, what is Tom Hanks's roles on these movies are is what they are supposed to be rather. Um, Tom Hanks '90s uh, at the time of the League of Their Own is a broadly comedic actor, and he's giving a broadly comedic performance in a comedy film. I'm not the Academy Awards. I like comedy uh, comedic performances, uh, and he's fine in it. But to be perfectly honest, uh, he has at least the good graces to bow out to the main characters of the movie. He. Uh, does scenes where he throws a baseball mitt at a kid. That's funny. That's good stuff. Uh, he has a scene where he, uh, let's see, stops drinking uh, alcohol and picks up a Coke. That's neat. That's cool. That's a nice little character moment for him. He dies. That's a nice little neat character moment for him. However, I think you'll find that it really does pale in comparison to watching Tom Hanks, beloved young Tom Hanks, who even at the time was a very well-respected actor, um, rotting from the inside out, being humiliated, humiliated uh, on a national scale, really, uh, you know, showing lesions, losing the color of his hair, like the color in his hair, eventually losing all color, struggling to breathe. It, it's a far more caustic tale to be told. And does that mean that it's better than A League of Their Own? I would argue yes. Does it mean that it is a more important story than A League of Their Own? you know, it depends on what you like, depends on what you like, certainly. What I will argue is that it is a more uh, lasting story. It is a more, you know, purposed story than A League of Their Own. Now, my friend Ryan here would have you believe that A League of Their Own is just as important, just as neat uh, as Philadelphia, but A League of Their Own simply just doesn't match. There is nothing in it that has teeth. It is a broadly nostalgic film, A League of Their Own, as opposed to Philadelphia, which is biting, if nothing else, haunting, if nothing else, uh, horrifying, if nothing else. And so, like, what are we actually talking about? And time. All right. So we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion. Uh, remember, there is no strict time limit. Just please be sure to be respectful of each other. Make your point and allow the other person to rebut. Don't cut each other off too much. 
uh, because it makes it a little difficult for the judges to pick up what they need to. But I'll let you guys feel it out and see how you do the first time around. With that said, it starts when the first competitor speaks. I do want to jump a little bit on what you had brought up earlier, Alex, regarding the whole League of Their Own being kind of a bit of a comedic uh, piece. And you are, and you do, and there are valid points. There is comedy because this is this is back during a time where women. This is that during a time of World War II, women's baseball is being said women are not valued like on an equal playing field of men. I mean, as far as I go with nostalgia senses, this is not even close to nostalgia. It's something that's still relative to this time. The comedy is there to be a good levity, but at the same time, this movie still has dramatic moments, especially in moments where these women who are wives, who have husbands who are out to war, they are worried day by day, wondering if they're going to get a letter that their husband died during battle. And there was, and there was definitely a scene, especially in the women's locker room, where a military man gives Tom Hanks a letter and Hanks reads it. He has to hold, he has to be stern. He has to be very, um, like, very set up. I mean, he has to be very strong because he knows the woman who's one of his players he's going to get the letter to is going to break down. And we do see that happening. When he gives her that letter, he is doing much, he being nothing but supporting. He is being very strong for allowing her to cry and let her emotions get out. Absolutely. What happens immediately following is all right, let's play a baseball game. Now, I'm not like that, which is a bit of a stark contrast to uh, what happens in uh, Philadelphia, where characters, it's not comedic at all. It's entirely serious. There are jokes in the movie, it's they give you some levity in Philadelphia, absolutely. But um, Denzel Washington accepts this case and he is immediately becomes a target. People immediately start uh, questioning his own sexuality. And indeed, you know, pretty much every character's sexuality, uh, habits, lifestyle choices, all everyone's character uh, is questioned in the film in a way that A League of Their Own just doesn't do. The movie doesn't have teeth. Uh, one character's husbands die. Another one gets married. Another one's husbands come home. Tom Hanks is cured of alcoholism by a conversation. Gina Davis takes I up mean, chewing tobacco. It is implied that it's cured, but it's more like he's just taking the steps to be a little more soberish. I mean, it's it, it, the, the one that's one. I will give you credit. That is one negative of the film, but there is some weight in that with Tom Hanks at least wanting to put away the alcohol because it's been shown throughout the majority of the film his attitude. And what he's like drinking, because I've mentioned before, he he shows no interest. He's just there for to collect a paycheck, and he doesn't value these women as players. It's not until these women start to step up he realizes he needs to step up. It's kind of more of him realizing that he has an opportunity. He needs to take the, most, the best of it, and at the same time realizing that he's no better of a person compared to these women who are trying to make the best out of a bad situation. Can I ask you a question about the cast of the League of Their Own? Mm-hmm. Um, who would you say, besides Tom Hanks, is the best performance? I would go with either Lori Petty, uh, Gina Davis. Um, I mean, even Madonna, even though it's a small part, she does a good job. Even um, oh my, oh my, Rosie O'Donnell. I'm forgetting the actress who plays uh, Doris, the woman who ends up getting married, because from her character standpoint, she has the physical standpoints of looking ugly, and then she comes into her own power, comes into her own sexuality as a woman and finds value in herself. Secondary uh, question. Are any of those performances fit to even touch Denzel's performance? Someone who, before you answer, someone who at the start of the film is broadly unaccepting of uh, people who are queer, goes through the process of being questioned as queer and comes out the other side as still potentially having biases, but having worked through at least some of them, a few of them, a couple of them. Because I would argue that the answer is no. And again, this is someone who recently gave A League of Their Own 4.5 stars. I would argue that performances from Gene Davis, from Madonna, from uh, you know the broadcast are not fit to touch Denzel's performance or indeed. Then you're Hanks comparing like these four, you're comparing uh, these roles to one role. And to be honest with Denzel's performance, I'm he comparing any of them. Job. But you can, but you can honestly replace Denzel with another actor, and they'll still give you a strong and time. Career. All right, good back and forth there, guys. We're going to go ahead and get into the closing arguments. You guys have one minute left on the round. Ryan, you are up first. Hank's performance in a league of their own is a strong one because uh, Alex mentioned before when it comes with 
uh, the difference between League of Their Own and Philadelphia. He says, if does this does League of Their Own have teeth? Is it a purposeful story and does it have a, and is it lasting? I will say it is a lasting story because it is still because it touches on a topic that is still being talked today and currently in our time of women's roles in society. That movie was approaching it on their roles trying to be athletes on the field, but even then, it is something that's still being carried today. It ha it's relatable, and the purpose behind that story was to show that women were more than just just housewives. There were more than just women during that period whose whole job was to have babies and be homemakers, which is still something being pushed onto women in this generation. Tom Hanks is slightly a bastion of that as of that line of thinking because before and then when he gets the job, he sees he doesn't like I said he doesn't value these women because he saw he's even said a few of them deserve to should be at home with the children, especially with one of the women who he yells at there's no crying in baseball who has to bring her child on the road with them. It is something that is Anton. still damn it. <laughs> All right, Alex, back over to you for the final minute of the round. Just to emphasize final point on absolutely no teeth league of their own concludes that the best way for uh women to make their way into the world is to be excellent at their craft and also be hot uh i find that to be a bit problematic of a conclusion uh i don't know why they stoop to it uh different times i guess philadelphia uh the film at least uh encourages you to examine your own biases examine everyone else's biases and conclude for yourself or at least try to move forward and become a better person. Uh, I don't see personally how you could say that the best Tom Hanks movies of the 90s, including previously chosen movies, is not Philadelphia. It is one, again, much like A League of Their Own, I would grant the point, uh, is something that we're still talking about, issues that still are being raised, issues that are still not really concluded, um, though medicine is getting better, thankfully. Uh, prejudices, issues, these are all things that we will be struggling with for years to come, especially since uh, fun fact, we refuse to talk about them on many open forums uh, like this one. Four seconds left. Happy Pride Month, everybody. Uh, this was a weird one to debate. We didn't know that. I forgot about <laughs> Well, there. I mean, for what it's worth, you just discussed it on an open forum. So. That's true. We, we tried. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, great first round there. I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back and bring our judges in. Uh, so we have... Just a couple of uh, quick fact checks. Uh, so at the start, there was a discussion amongst uh, Tom Hanks's role in both of these films in terms of uh, whether he is leading or supporting. Now, obviously, uh, there's no easy way to just look up the runtime of every actor in a movie. But for what it's worth, in both A League of Their Own and Philadelphia, Tom Hanks is the first credited actor in both casts. And he won his Oscar for Philadelphia in the best actor role, which the Academy dignifies as having to be the lead of the film. You cannot submit more than one actor uh, from the same film for leading actor. Uh, with that said, uh, the other thing was uh, the character who got married in the movie. Uh, I believe Ryan had said the name Doris, which is Rosie O'Donnell, who he named. I decided to try and research that really quickly because I've never seen A League of Their Own. And I believe the character of Marla, played by Megan Cavanaugh, also gets, mar gets married in the film. Uh, so there is that as well. Now, uh, because I saw the reaction in the background, the fact checks are just the fun things that I do while I'm not actively producing the show. They're not supposed to affect the argument, just giving you guys the information. But the judges know that. So I'm going to go ahead and go to Brian first. Who gets your vote and what was the main sell? For me, I'm going to go to this one. We talked more about uh, the film and Tom Hanks' performance. And Alex didn't really talk much about Philadelphia. So my pick is going for Ryan. Okay, so the first vote goes to Ryan. Malcolm, down to you. Who gets your vote and what was the selling point? Um, I'm actually going to go the opposite way. I'm going to go with Alex on this. Um, because I think Alex talked a lot about why Tom Hanks was great in Philadelphia and how that movie is sort of still relevant today with the issues of raised and all that. All right, so it is a one-to-one -one split, which means, Stacey, I'll go over to you. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? Um, Alex got my vote and was what's the best movie and convinced me that's the best movie. And I just heard a lot more negatives about A League of Their Own and not really any negatives about Philadelphia. All right. Well, there we go. Judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back and bring the competitors back into the stream as we will go ahead and move on to question number two. 
Uh, and with this one, we're going to be getting into a horror franchise, which I think has come under kind of a public reappreciation over the last couple of years due to the fact that it's in the spotlight again, which is the Halloween franchise. Uh, obviously, while Halloween Kills received more of a mixed reception than the 2018 film from David Gordon Green, uh, the fact that it is back in the limelight, and I, I think most people would say Kills isn't nearly as bad as the worst entries in this series. Uh, yeah, there we go. See, uh, it is kind of due for reappraisal. Now, we could sit here and uh, praise the movie, but uh, I also like watching people shit on things, so we're going to do that instead. Uh, the question at hand here is, what is the worst performance by a leading actor or actress? Uh, that's just a copy paste from when I roughly wrote the question, but it's actor or actress uh, in the Halloween series. Uh, and there are plenty to choose from because it's a horror franchise. I mean, goddamn, they are filled with bad performances if they go any more than like three deep. Uh, so we got some good picks today. Uh, now, the only clarification for the judges is uh, characters who appear in more than one movie, the uh, competitors were asked to pick a main film to focus on, which they do have. It is a part of their answers. Uh, so just so you guys are aware, if it's someone who's in more than one film, they do have a specific one they're pulling from. Uh, but with that said, we'll go ahead and get to the debate. Alex, you are up first. So I'll go ahead and bring it in and it can timer will start when you begin speaking. Staying on the subject of acting, uh, we go from uh, one of the very best to, well, um, to act is to convince me, uh, the uh, me, you, the audience, that uh, you are not the actor, that you are in fact Denzel Washington, that you're in fact not Denzel Washington, you are in fact a lawyer from Philadelphia who is on TV sometimes. Um, on that subject, uh, some people do it poorly some people are in films and do not do it at all enter buster rhymes from halloween resurrection uh, uh freddie harris freddie harris uh, our lord and savior who plays a street karate enthusiast television producer who also maybe did music can't remember uh, who is in love with tyra banks also cannot do that convincingly um who says all of his lines with all of the enthusiasm of a six-year-old with a knock-knock joke it's just not very compelling even in one of the lesser entries of this hollowed franchise you had to get that one there at the end didn't you ryan i go over to you sir you got one minute on the clock You when it comes with the Halloween films, uh, especially for an act for a leading actor, uh, the performance, yeah, I do want to believe that I do want to believe that you this is not the actor, but it's the character. But also, if the, the your performance is able to match with the tone or is able to supersede it, but unfortunately, for my pick, this actress unfortunately was not able to supersede it because her character was just made to be nothing more than a uh, comatose rag, which is uh, Scout Taylor Compton, who plays Laurie Strode in Halloween 2, the Rob Zombie version. Now, Zombie, I can talk about his versions as much as I want to, but the problem is that in this version, though, Laurie Strode was supposed to be someone who is dealing, who's heavily traumatic after someone like Michael Myers has just killed her friends, and instead, she is which we thought I was going to get in the opening first 20 minutes. But later on, when she gets kidnapped, she's turned into nothing more than just a drugged out uh, comatose patient having hallucinations until she makes a heel turn towards the end. Her performance gave me nothing to admit, to drive me and invest in her personal journey. And time. All right, we're going to go into the two minute section. Alec, back over to you. So there is a proud tradition of in film to include uh, non actors, musicians, the like, uh, in the in your movies and try and coast on credibility. Those actors usually tend to say the lines into the camera. Uh, Common has actually made a fantastic career of this. Um, okay. Just in various side projects, he'll show up and say his lines and be fine. Two and a half stars mid. Um, Buster Rhymes appears is the driving force of the movie with his absurd let's go into this murder house show, which I guess MTV could have put out at some point. And uh, then he just stays in the movie for like a while, actually. 
does line reads with such credible actors as Tyra Banks and others. Um, and it is overall unenjoyable, odd, considering the scenes before and after involve grisly murders. And even in one of the goofier entries of the franchise, uh, overall strike as Busta Rhyme showed up and we were like, yes, I'm a fan. It seems like Jackie Chan in the Kung Fu Panda movies, someone really wanted to meet him. And then they were like, I've got it. I'm a writer. I know what I'll do. I'll cast Busta Rhymes. Scout Taylor Compton is like an actress. She's trying. Is she stuck in a Rob Zombie movie, which is horrifying as a proposition for an actor? Yeah, absolutely. But she did the first one. So she knew what she was signing up for. Now, is she stuck in a weird, demented uh, acid drop of a movie? Yes, absolutely she is. But I would argue that her performance is not what's wrong with the movie. It's the tone, the direction, the writing, the cinematography, the lighting, the editing. Uh, the music's fine. The villain is fine. And that's really how you describe Rob Zombie's Halloween 1 and 2. Bad, but she was okay, I guess, if you think about it. And that is time. Uh, I want to take a moment to apologize to, to Common. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say I disagree with him, but it came out of nowhere. Mid. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Ryan, good. back over. <laughs> good job, Common. Keep making money. Uh, back over to you, Ryan. Two minutes on the clock, sir. I think the funny thing is when you mentioned some of the, the stuff that about his films, like the editing, lighting, the uh, cinematography, I mean, some of that stuff actually got my attention more than her performance in Halloween 2, personally, because, well, not just personally, but because from a standpoint, the whole film was meant to be about Mike, about uh, the whole film was meant to be about Michael Myers, once again, not killed off by Laurie Strode, coming back to go after her and you felt that this whole sense of dread is what is Michael going to do again? Is he going to stalk her? Is he going to kill her like he did in the first one? But the whole film drags itself and lore and um, Scout's performance, unfortunately, instead of trying to prevent trying to portray actual trauma because she is an actress, she actually has some credited TV roles and a couple of some movies before she did uh, the first Halloween film. The scene that the entire film, she's meant to just scream. She's meant to just shout. And uh, that's all she was reduced to. Buster Rhymes, yes, he's a rapper, not an experienced actor. But honestly, he was trying more in his film. Was it not believable? Maybe not. But at least with Buster Rhymes, though, you knew what you, you a part of you knew what you were going to get. I knew going in what I was going to get with Buster Rhymes, having seen his performance in Shaft. I knew exactly what I was going to get from Buster Rhymes, knowing that he was going to be almost a two by four, but he was going to be a two by four that was trying to turn itself into a, 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 a masterpiece wooden sculpture. The only performance I would say that was worth, if I had to go with the worst performance in Halloween um, Resurrection, it's actually Tyra Banks. I only get the decency of her getting killed off, but even then it takes a while for her to get killed off. And Buster Rhymes, he, he may be bland a little bit, but he actually becomes more entertaining once he goes one-on-one -on -one with Michael Myers. And I remember from the trailer of Halloween Resurrections, his line, trick-or-treat, motherfucker, we were waiting. I was waiting for that moment to happen. And when it came, it's like Sam Jackson snakes on a plane. I went through all this garbage just so I can get and something. Time. <laughs> all right. We're going to go ahead and get into the four-minute open discussion. The timer will start when the first competitor speaks. Ryan, yes. I think it says a lot that both of us had the option of choosing a literal five-year-old uh, and still went in opposite directions. Um, now, look, we can sit here and debate whether Tyra Banks is a worse actor <laughs> than Buster Rhymes. I would argue she probably has more credits to her name, and I believe she's just like this vapid nonsense person. That's fine. Sit here and tell me that in Halloween Resurrection, it makes sense from any perspective to have Buster Rhymes kick Michael Myers through a window and have it be the end of the movie. 
that's the climax of the film. The climax of the film is Buster Rhymes yeah. saying trick or treat <laughs> and then kicking the villain of the series through a window. And that's how it ends. Tell me that is defensible. I mean, it doesn't end after that, but I still, but like I said, I still found enjoyment out of it because let's be honest, when that film, the moment Jamie Lee Curtis was killed off, to me, I felt there's no way this film is going, it's going to start sinking. And Buster Rhymes, yeah, like I, I said before, he tries. He tries. And I will say, with his character being this uh, guy who set, who's trying to do this reality show in a murder house, let's be honest, this film was taking advantage of pretty much MTV culture of putting people in scary situations and then having it recorded shown live or pre-recorded in front of millions of people it was not something new and old so Buster Rhymes really wasn't trying to elevate anything with Scout I will say with Scout she was given a character who unfortunately had a, a big hill to climb from Jamie Lee Curtis this is apples to oranges but even then with Rob Zombie's film he had himself a tone to set in this film and he looked like he was, especially in Halloween 2, he was executing this tone by making it very artistic and like an hallucinated acid trip dream. Okay, especially when you're dealing with Michael Myers. Problem was is that there was just nothing with Laurie's character in this film from Scout's performance that made me believe or try to get me to guess or invest where what was going on. The film takes a turn from her story to focus on Michael killing the sheriff, played by Brad Dorf, to once again focus on the relationship between Loomis and Michael Myers when the film was meant to be the relationship between Michael, Laurie, and Michael's weird obsession with his mother who's dead. All of which has nothing to do with Scout Taylor Compton's performance. You said earlier, you said it, that she was reduced to screaming and running from Michael Myers, which I remind you, is the role of a scream queen. That is literally what they are meant to do. It's in the title. Um, and to be fair, and, and and I'll give Scout Taylor Compton this, she's not the best performer ever in a, in a Halloween film. But what I will say this, she has a lot more that she's trying to do than most of them. I'll give Rob Zombie this exact one credit. He had a thing for Scout Taylor Compton to try and do. Something that Jamie Lee Curtis did not have. She just had screaming. She just had running away. She just had protecting the kids. That's it. That is the full extent of 1978's Halloween. Scout Taylor Compton is playing that. She is playing an addiction angle. She is playing a mental health angle. All at the same time in a movie's runtime, which is what? 130, 140, maybe, maybe two hours? All I'm saying is that try a little bit more consideration given that she is literally the the performer for this film, as opposed to Buster Rhymes, who got the credit of lead performer, uh, but instead was reduced to standing in rooms, telling, uh, saying lines with the biggest smile on his face, even if the line is, don't worry, you'll be perfectly safe. Well, that was like, the it's... whole... <laughs> I mean, that was the thing with... Oh, wait, there's not enough time to counter that. Nah, so... <laughs> and I... <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get into the closings. Uh, Alex, you are up first. Once again, we could have picked the small child, and in retrospect, <laughs> it would have probably gone just as decently. What I'm saying is that Buster Rhymes is not an actor. Uh, Buster Rhymes is not a comedian. Buster Rhymes is not a screen performer in any meaningful way. And to put him in even one of the goofier entries of this franchise and have him be memed kind of to death a little bit um, says that really this is a low point of the franchise. Scout Taylor Compton, I would argue, is better. She's in a weirder movie. But even that, as Ryan has said, has some appreciative qualities. Uh, did it distract for Ryan? I would say perhaps. He said so. But honestly, let's just break it down. Scout Taylor Compton was fine. Buster Rhymes was weirdly stiff and bad. And that's all you need to know going into the final choosing. All right. And that is time. Ryan, back over to you for the final minute of the round.
given the Rob Zombie movies we get after Halloween two, like uh, House of the Thousand, like House, like House of the Dead, uh, Three from Hell, and uh, oh my God, the, the, that that little trilogy of films that we get from Rob Zombie, we do see better performances from actors who know exactly what they've signed up for. Now, Alex did mention earlier, Scout knew she was what she was signing up for from being in the first Halloween, but the issue was. Is that because she knew what she was signing up for? Her performance didn't step up. It didn't, I won't say elevate, but it didn't match exactly the tone that Rob was aiming for in this film. Malcolm McDowell, who is a very great actor, even when he was playing a jerk and a jackass in the second one, you were able to at least buy the moment he realized he made a mistake, he made a mistake. Busta Rhymes, compared to the, the rappers who were acting in the 2000s from Master P, Fabulous, DMX, they, Busta Rhymes at least was a more solid performance in Halloween Resurrection than DMX was in the in the, in the the other movies he did, Exit Wounds, Cradle to the Grave, especially with Master P and Fabulous in the scary movie. And films. times. I know Ryan is not talking shit about Cradle to the Grave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't talk shit about it. I just, I just <laughs> that, that, that was just an education on just how many rappers from the '90s tried to have acting careers. Remember Master P? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna let you guys laugh about that in the background while I bring in our judges uh, to take care of this round. Uh, so I have just again just a couple of fact checks while these guys are getting their final thoughts together. Uh, Busta Rhymes does technically count as an actor uh he did have a film career for what it's worth it didn't last much longer than this movie but he did have one uh when comparing busta rhymes to tyra banks uh tyra banks has including television films because i needed to expand it somehow uh has about 10 roles in which she is playing a character and not herself in a film busta rhymes does have slightly more than her he has 12. Uh, if I picked the correct five-year-old, that would be Danielle Harris, who was the star of both Halloween 4 and Halloween 5. She was uh, an 11-year-old while filming the first one, probably would have been about 12 when she filmed the second of her two films. Uh, she was technically in the third one, I believe, but that role is so small, it's not worth counting. Uh, Halloween 2 is 105 minutes, so it's about as long as Alex said it was. Uh, and the Rob Zombie films that were released after Halloween 2 include The Lords of Salem, 31, Three from Hell, the animated film The Haunted World of El Superbisto, and the upcoming The Monsters, which I still can't believe is a thing they're letting Rob Zombie do. Uh, with that said, Malcolm, I'm going to go up to you. Uh, to be fair, I don't know why they let him make movies, but that's a whole other discussion. Uh, I'm going up to you, Malcolm. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Um, this was actually tough because um, there was, it was a very even debate um, because they both kind of knocked each other down. Um, but I'm going to... Um, slightly go to um ryan on this um because i heard a lot about him but how like scout taylor Compton was apparently really good in the first rob zombie one then was who role was reduced a lot to, to in the second one and that just made her uh, seem more worse than everything else um but yeah all right Stacey, I go down to you. How do you judge this crazy round? Who gets your vote? Um, mine also goes to Ryan. Um, the thing about Tyra Banks being the worst part of Resurrection, I thought, was a good dig. Um, he did actually talk quite a bit about why Buster Rhymes isn't that bad in the movie. It sounds like Buster Rhymes was doing what he was supposed to do, even if what he was supposed to do was crap. Um, and that um, Scout Taylor Compton just what he said about her not getting him invested in anything and just basically screaming and um, a lot. He said a lot that convinced me. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. I'll go ahead and sit you in the back as we will move on to round number three. Uh, and, and this is one that I am personally very interested to see. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue talking about actors. I'm going to assume we're not going to be shitting on them this time. Uh, especially because Common wasn't given as an answer. But we will see what happens. Uh, so obviously, off the heels of last year's success in No Time to Die, Daniel Craig has exited the Bond franchise on a high note, much higher than if he would have exited on Spectre. Uh, and so now we are looking at 
who is the next James Bond? Now, the question at hand is simply who should play the next James Bond. Uh, however, it is worth mentioning that there's a lot of answers out there uh, that are, I feel like, the common obvious answers. We've all heard the uh, Henry Cavill's of the world, uh, those who argue that Bond should be diverse and somebody else should come in to play the role, all seem to gravitate to Idris Elba for some reason, like no other actor could play it. Uh, so I want to credit these guys before we get into it, because they have both picked outside the park answers, which I think will make for a really interesting round. Uh, I also want to quickly, because I forgot to put the card in there, give credit to Zachary Shelton, who's actually the one who wrote and submitted this question. Uh, if you would like to have your question submitted to Movie Battleground, please just contact me and let me know you have a question you want to see debated. I'm happy to do it. Just make sure I know who is messaging me, because if I get a random question, it's not going to get asked. Uh, with that said, though, guys, we're going to go ahead and get into it. Ryan, you are back up first for this one, so the timer will start when you begin speaking. Obviously, with the Bond franchise, there's going to be a lot people are going to be expecting for who's going to be the next portrayal of Bond. For me, if I'm going to pick an actor who uh, is going to be the next James Bond, he's got to be somebody who can be able to uh, really hold himself, hold his own when he's on camera. Not when he's just interacting with others, but is able to do a good job emoting, who is able to you know, really give you the look. Of a, of a weathered spy, either if he's just someone got their double O status or a very a, an aged veteran. And just to go on in, I think for my pick for James Bond is Arthur Darville. Now, people don't know, know the name. He has been, he's a regular in uh, British television and British uh, films, most notably from his portrayals uh, in uh, Broadchurch in Doctor Who, and if any, comic, any uh, geek fans out there, he played Rip Hunter in Legends of Tomorrow. Now, with Arthur Doggle, he had he is a very wide ranged actor. Um, he de and and from going, coming from British television, he has the experience to hold himself on camera against very thespian thesp uh, thespian trained actors. I just wasted three and seconds trying to say thespian. <laughs> thespian. All right, we're going to go over to Alex. Time starts when you begin speaking. I'll admit, I went a little bit outside. Uh, maybe even more outside than Ryan. Ryan picked a... Honestly, if you had to just cast on looks alone, uh, based on previous James Bond, James Bond, uh, yeah, maybe Arthur Darville should do it. Uh, if you just look at him. Uh, that is, if you know who he is. Uh, because he hasn't been in anything notable, at least not in a while. Uh, I went with a more interesting, I think, at least in my opinion, choice. I went with Dev Patel. Uh, you know Dev Patel, Slumdog Millionaire, uh, Lion, uh, Green Knight recently. Uh, a star. Somebody who would be in a film like this. As we know, James Bond, not historically a star maker. More of a star confirmer franchise, somebody who could uh, lead a franchise for years to come. Uh, both uh, both Ryan and I picked uh, fairly young people, but I would argue that Dev Patel is already primed and ready. He just needs the vehicle to do it. Um, and time. All right, we're going to go ahead and go into the two-minute uh, expansion. Ryan, back over to you for Arthur Darville. I do agree with Al. We definitely did went outside the box, though. Uh, I will say, though, that my pick of Arthur, now, to be agreed, yeah, if you don't know who he is, then, yeah, it would be difficult to say, is he the right choice for it? But I think the one great thing about Bond, uh, if you want to make a franchise, is to get somebody who is, I won't say is unknown, but somebody who at least is not too big of an uh, too big of a star in order to uh, overtake overshadow the character of bond because all the everyone's throwing out cavill idris elba just to name a few they're there's just they're they're mega stars at this point in their career the moment they are if they are cast as bond people are just going to see those actors not the character 
Darvel is somebody who is at least known in popular culture for his roles in Doctor Who and Legends of Tomorrow, especially in England for his roles in his role in Broadchurch. He's at least he has a no, there's a noble fan base out there where he's recognizable. And because he's part of these projects, would invite people to go back and watch those performances to see, hmm, I can actually see this man be James Bond. And also for James Bond, I think the best thing for this character is uh he, because of Darvel, yes, he does have the visual look for it. He's got a really good, uh, stri- a great, really good, great jawline. Man can definitely be able to grow a good mustache or a goatee needed for the character if you want to show him as a, a weathered aged veteran. But for but what I can say for his performance, from alone in Broadchurch, there has been scenes where Darvel has been a part. Has been he was you know playing across from Olivia Coleman and David Tennant to where he has played from stern concerned and so and also physically also uh visually emoting someone who is holding secrets and also because I, because i picked he's british he's got a great accent so i mean honestly if i can i can honestly hear arthur darvel we sweet whisper sweet nothings to me while giving me a nice little deep stare into my eyes like he's looking into my soul so i picked the part because i know he can do the charm very well and I'm just going to concede my time before I continue with the fantasies. That's fine. Uh, you have two minutes to get that one out of your system. Please do it off camera. <laughs> Alex, back over to you for two minutes. It's true. Ryan would have you believe that Arthur Darville is a uh, huge television star. What he regrets to mention about his time in Doctor Who is that it was 10 years ago over. Um what he regrets to tell you about uh, Legend of Tomorrow is that that show got canceled and he was not really like a headlining part of that show. He was a recurring <laughs> cast member. Honestly, if we were casting Arthur Darvel for film parts, I mean, the man's a dead ringer for Constantine. That's what he should be playing. That's that's your vehicle for you. Uh, as opposed to Dev Patel, who is in fact uh, the star that I was saying. You, you said that... Uh, Arthur Darvel could be made by James Bond. That's not really what James Bond does. As I've said before, when Sean Connery got Dr. No, he was already doing movies with John Wayne. Uh, Daniel Craig was, uh, I think, starring in the same year that uh, Casino was released. He was in Munich. Uh, of course, Pierce Brosnan was a huge star. Timothy Dalton was a big star. Uh, George Lazenby wasn't, and that movie is widely regarded as one of the worst Bond entries, at least from the performance standpoint. Dev Patel is a star. He is ready. He is the right age. He has uh, legitimate martial arts experience on an international competition level in Taekwondo. This guy is ready. He just needs the correct vehicle to push him. He's gotten uh, critical success uh, here in the States and abroad with things like Slumdog Millionaire. He is a BAFTA winner. Uh, His films like Lion, uh, The Green Knight recently, uh, things like uh, Hotel Mumbai. These are all films that Dev Patel has starred in that people saw that people liked. Uh, Ryan Payne, for all of, of Arthur Darvel's television credits, could not and has not told us about a single film that Arthur Darvel has starred in, uh, and let alone tell us that people saw him in those movies and liked him. And that's really what the argument is. The next James Bond is not going to be picked from a British TV show from 10 years ago. It's going to be picked by what's happening right now. It always is. It always has been, and it always will be. And time. All right, we're going to get into the four-minute open discussion. The timer will start when the first competitor speaks. I will say that last part you said is a bit debatable because when you said with George Lazen, because when you said about Lazenby's performance in there, and when he was picked, he was he was a model. He was mostly known for just commercials, in which he didn't even act in. And from the from the documentary series that he did uh, to be Bond, he practically kind of lied his way into the role. And he impressed the director so much, the director decided to back him up on it, even though he had no acting experience. Now, you are right. I didn't list a lot of films that uh, Arthur Darvel is well known for. Uh, I mainly win his television roles because, tel- well, obviously, television movies are a different beast, but they still require the same thing for you to act on camera. And also, one thing television is able to accentuate more than movies is this right here the, the, the face, uh, pretty much the face and able to emote, been able to physically react, because you, with uh, Daniel Craig in Casino Royale, after the action sequences, most of his best performances 
when he is sitting down, acting and emoting across another actor. The train scene he has with with Eva Green, the card scenes that he the card scenes he has with Max Mickelson, Jeffrey Wright. Those are great moments that stand out more his career than personally. I would say the action scenes, especially we see earlier with John Connery's career and with Pierce Brosnan. An actor has got to be able to command their presence on screen, which I believe Arthur Darvel can. Dev Patel, you listed so many credits of his and the films. He he does he unfortunately falls into the categories of he, he falls into that same well that Cavill, Idris Elba, and so many others because he's kind of almost too big of a he's too big of an actor for the role of James Bond. He's more likely to play a supporting character in a Bond film than the actual character. I would entirely disagree on that, and that is given the fact that Dev Patel's movies historically uh, are not big box office earners. Uh, you said Arthur Darvel's extensive uh, acting. I mean, this this shot, that is most of what Slumdog Millionaire is. That is what most of Lion is. Doing line reads, listen, doing line reads with Nicole Kidman is far more interesting of a prospect to me from an acting pr uh, perspective than doing line reads with Gorilla Grodd. So like, I, I don't understand that as a, as as a point um like ryan you're really stretching with some of these um i mean it's not much of a stretch though because in broadchurch he acts across many great actors in british television and the bbc they always liked to uh have great strong projects with with actors like tenant like with coleman like jim broadbent like even idris elba had himself a bbc series uh luther which shows you that in television especially if we're talking about it, uh, well if i'm talking about british actors their performance on television stands out much strong and is much longer lasting. Right. So tell me about Arthur Dovell's extensive acting awards, like I did with Dev Patel. Tell me about his BAFTAs that he do totally doesn't have. Tell me about any of his Screen Acting Guild's uh, nominations that he totally doesn't have. Tell me about anybody that he's done a scene with that is remotely interesting from a, a worldwide franchise uh, media, like, perspective. Tell me about any of those things. This is the problem with Arthur Darvel is that he is, and I saw compilation videos, uh, Legend of Tomorrow, he is effectively a pretty face. He is next to pretty much a nobody doing line reads with, let's see, which Bring It On movie was that lady in? Oh my goodness, which one was it? No, I'm, I'm, Look, I'm kidding, of course, but like, no, what I'm I saying is that saying, American but... TV produced for uh for cheap is not the same thing as dev patel's uh extensive not only history i mean you could book like theaters alone based on the pure population of people that would go see it just because he's british indian that is a huge demographic that for years has been underserved and you could sell entire theaters on that alone and time all right we're going to get into the closings each of you guys has one minute left uh, Ryan, we're going to go back over to you. You have one minute when you're ready. All of the critical accolades and awards that Alex has listed of Dev Patel definitely is valid arguments for why he should be Bond. But also at the same time, somebody who has these acumens, who's been in films, um, as much as uh, Arthur Darville doesn't have that much film experience, but the television experience, I say, counter counters that. But with Dev Patel, with his films that he has done, like Lion, uh, Hotel Mumbai, the greatest, the the greatest Marigold Hotel, the second greatest Marigold, the, no, the best Marigold Hotel, whatever. Those films, while critically are responsive, they don't. Rick, they're not really good when it comes with domestic box office. They do better worldwide, though. And Bond is someone who's old. And Bond films mostly have been stronger in the American box office. I mean, like, not compared to worldwide. It's apples to oranges. But even still, Arthur Darvel, I would say, is a great choice. Because while Bond, he's, Alex says, a star carrier, I still believe that Arthur Darvel is somebody you can attach to, bring on this first film, have him carry along two or three films within his timeline because he is someone I truly believe that can and actually sell me a British spy. All right, Alex, back over to you, sir. You have the final minute of the round when you're ready. It is part of the damning curse of being in this community is that I, at least on some level, understand how films are made. Arthur Darvel is not on the A-list. He is 
not on the B list, he's not on the C list. Dave Patel would read the Bond script before Arthur Darvel died. Um, it, the, Arthur Darvel will not come close to playing James Bond. Dev Patel has a shot. Dev Patel has a shot to bring a new perspective on the character, a softer, less a salty perspective, hopefully. He has uh, he has martial training. He's been in action films before. He's been a dramatic performer before. He is a well enough known actor to be able to sell a movie, literally actually sell the performance. And yes, he will actually be bringing it uh, to a new group of people that perhaps hasn't been interested in the James Bond franchise, potentially making that more money. Uh, this is how films are made. Uh, the James Bond people that love it, Joe Fairley, for example, would go see a 007 movie no matter what. Bringing a new audience to that will only help the franchise grow, which in time generally is what we all want for film. And time. That was the wrong one. All right, guys. Another really good round there. I'm going to go ahead and sit you guys in the back while the judges come in for the deliberation. Uh, so to clean up some things here. So at the start, uh, the ages of the actors uh, was brought up. So just to clarify that, at the moment, if they were to go to shoot today, Arthur Darville is 39 years of age. Dev Patel is 32 years of age. So they are both uh, decently young for a Hollywood actor. Uh, to compare that to the most recent Bonds, uh, when Daniel Craig shot Casino Royale, he would have been 36 years old, and Pierce Brosnan, when he shot Goldeneye, would have been 41 years old. So they are certainly well within the range in terms of age to take on the role of James Bond. Uh, Arthur Darville uh, is mostly known for his television work. The three shows that were specifically brought up were Doctor Who, Broadchurch, and Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, for Doctor Who, he served as a series lead for six, season six and seven and was recurring in series five. That was 2010 to 2012. He was a lead on Broadchurch from 2013 to 2017. And on Legends of Tomorrow in America, he served as the series lead for the first two seasons of the show before taking on a recurring role in season three, exiting the show at the end of season three, before returning as a guest star in the final season season of the show. I believe it was for the 100th episode. Uh, uh, it was brought up Daniel Craig's roles leading up to Casino Royale. Uh, some of the biggest roles he had leading up to it included supporting roles in Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, and Road to Perdition. He starred in Lair Cake in 2004, and Munich came out the year before Casino Royale in 2005, with Casino Royale coming out in 2006. Uh, in terms of Dev Patel being considered a blockbuster actor uh, on the likes of those who are up for the role, obviously everything is subjective enough to debate, but for what it's worth, his three biggest films, both in terms of blockbuster budget as well as box office, uh, when you kind of average the two out, would be his debut Slumdog Millionaire, The Last Airbender, and Chappie. Uh, the name of the film you're looking for is The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel and The Second Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Uh, Arthur Darville does not have any major award wins that I could find. Dev Patel currently has one Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor from the film Lion. Uh, he has won a BAFTA for Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Lion and was nominated for Lead for Slumdog Millionaire. And finally, for what it's worth, neither of these guys are the betting favorite, but that's why I like that they were selected. For anyone who's curious, the latest betting updates, uh, for those who like to bet on these things, were put out in April. Uh, currently, uh, actor Reggae Jean Page, I apologize if I mispronounced that, is actually the betting favorite to get the role, followed shortly by Henry Cavill, Aiden Turner, Michael Fassbender, Tom Hardy, Idris Elba, James Norton, Killian Murphy, Richard Madden, and Tom Hopper. Anyone else is such low odds that it's not really worth talking about. But again, that's just if you're a betting man. With that said, we're going to go to the judges for this one. Stacy, I go to you. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? And you are muted. Of course I was muted. I knew I'd do that at least once. <laughs> um, I do know who Arthur Darville is for the record, and I'm a fan and I've met him and he was delightful, but um, my vote goes to Alex. Uh, um, I do think that James Bond is usually someone who is a bit better known, at least recognizable from other things when they get cast and Arthur Darville is not to most people, unfortunately. Um, and his his closing really sold me on him that he should be because I heard a lot about why he probably would be, but not a lot of should. But the end when he said about selling it to a new group of people who weren't previously interested in James Bond really sold it to me on why he should be. All right, Brian, I go down to you. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? Yeah, for me, I go to go for Alex. He knocked out Ryan about uh, how Arthur Donald worked on the face and with... Uh, 
Alex can mention about uh, how Dead Patel is more memorable, so Alex gets a point. Okay. All right, thank you, guys. I'll go ahead and put you in the back and bring the competitors in as we will head on to question number four, uh, which is a, a bit of a conundrum. Um, I want to officially apologize to, comp to the competitor. Uh, now, normally in a match, you guys may get to worst questions or to best questions. This is the first time I've ever accidentally given basically the same unique question twice. Because uh, this is basically the same exact question as the last one. However, by the time I realized this, it was too late to switch it on you guys. So here we are. With that said, the question is, which actor who has never appeared in the franchise should take over as the lead of the Mission Impossible films when Tom Cruise retires? Uh, currently, I believe his contract lasts for two more films, which would get him through seven and eight. I want to say the subtitle is like Dead Reckoning or something. I don't remember, but I didn't yeah, look it up. I it's it something with dead in the title. Uh, but he's got two more of them coming, uh, and after that, as of now, he is finished with the franchise. But we all know if something makes money, uh, you're never going to let it die. So thank you. That is correct. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, so who's going to take over for him is the question. Uh, again, not my intention to give these guys who should take over a big spy franchise. In fact, you could argue the only two major spy franchises currently in film. But hey, it is what it is. Next time, I'll just give one of them a born question in case they decide to reboot that again. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring the timer in. Alex, you are up first when you begin speaking. Well, I, for one, am, in fact, sick of Tom Cruise's uh, punchable face, and I think it is time for a new lead. Uh, Dead Reckoning aside, if we just stopped with him altogether, that'd be fine with me, and I think it'd be fine with a lot of people. Uh, but if we had to replace him, and I think we should. I think we definitely should um replace him that is uh we should go with someone who is peaking at the height of the popularity uh somebody who can fill the roles that tom cruise does and do even more uh go even further beyond i'm speaking of course about our lord and savior oscar isaac uh oscar isaac who is uh currently producing film uh currently on like the run of his career uh really at the height of his popularity and somebody who is believable in all facets of Mission Impossible, uh, possibility being action sequences, uh, acting, uh, command of presence, and just in general being a leading force in the industry. Uh, from selling tickets, getting people into the theater, Oscar Isaac is the way to go. And time. All right, Ryan, over to you for your opening minute. I will say one thing I did agree on with Alex from our discussion on Bond was actor who's going to be taking over a franchise is someone who needs to bring in a new audience to the franchise. While I may have failed to uh, accentuate that with Arthur, Arthur Double, I will say the next, my actor, my pick, I think is someone who will be able to bring a brand new audience to the Mission Impossible films because he is already captivating so many people at, in his performances in Stranger Things franchise. I'm talking about the best babysitter, best boyfriend, best guy, Steve Harrington, Joe Keery, the actor Joe Keery, who plays Steve Harrington in the films. I think he is, I'll, I'll admit, his filmography is very short, so he's still early in his career. But because of the performances he's put in Stranger Things and the fact that when uh, he was one of my favorite standouts in Free Guy, I will say that Joe Curie is somebody that you put him as the new lead for the Mission Impossible film, you will not only get a brand new audience, you will also get uh, fresh new energy injected into the franchise to where Steve Joe Curie is someone who can be who's, and uh, flexible. All right, so we got Oscar Isaac versus Joe Keery. Somehow that might be even a more odd couple matchup than the last one. <laughs> uh, Alex, I'm going to go back over to you, sir. Two minutes on the clock. Ryan would have you believe that Joe Keery is the perfect person to take over Mission Impossible because he is a fresh, young perspective uh, coming out of a hit show. What Ryan fails to uh, negotiate uh, or say, I should say, is that he is the ninth listed lead on Stranger Things, 13th if you go according to Wikipedia and not by IMDb, he is the fourth build in Free Guy. And you were thinking, what about that Hulu movie that he did? That's true, he has led exactly one project. 
that is exactly one project called Spree, which if yes. you didn't see, don't worry, nobody else did. Uh, that is opposed to Oscar Isaac, who you had almost certainly did see in any one of his Marvel projects, Star Wars. Uh, he did a thing with the MCU recently. Uh, this is somebody who can and for sure uh, can lead a franchise because he was doing that already recently. Uh, not to go over brass tax, but Joe Keery is not the guy. Uh, Oscar Isaac is the guy. Uh, Ryan would have you believe that Joe is a young voice. What he fails to tell you is that Joe Keery's 30 years old right now. And I don't think that YouTube compilations of being the best single mother on Stranger Things is really going to cut it when you're talking about one of the biggest, <laughs> I'm sorry, the second biggest debatable, but one of the two biggest spy franchises, and honestly, the only spy franchises that we have at the moment. If we give that to Joe Keery, the franchise tanks, which, I mean, fine, bless this for us to study in fandom, but I think it's an odd take to want to tank a franchise instead of having it succeed. Think about Tom Cruise right now planning on bombing Dead Reckoning. It's a silly thing for you to imagine, and it's a weird thing for a studio to want to do. Studios don't take that kind of chance, which is why, unfortunately, we will never see Dev Patel as James Bond. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. And time. All right. We are going to uh, go into or going back to Ryan. Uh, for his two minutes. Yeah, Joe Curry is very young in his career to get started. And despite Alex, you know, saying that Joe is in his, like, he's 30, he's in his 30s, to play, to you know, to be a lead of a franchise, Tom Cruise, was 34, 33 when Mission Impossible came out. So during that time of filming, Tom Cruise was already in his 30s. Now, difference between him and Joe Curie, Tom Cruise already had himself a bit of a career going on in with films like Risky Business, Top Gun, you know, to name a few. So he's had the experience of a lead. Yes, Spree was not something that many people caught on Hulu. But let's be honest, not many people pay attention to a lot of the Hulu original projects because Hulu is not good at marketing that stuff. But nevertheless, to say, regardless of where he was building Stranger Things, because of his performance his, as Steve Harrington, he went from somebody who people don't want to see be hurt. People want to see him always survive until the next season. Even right now in season four, which I'm not going to spoil, people are on the edge of their seats to make sure that his character is not going to be killed off before the next season. Going on in Joe Curie, he shows on Stranger Things. He has charisma. He shows compassion. He can be able to act across young act, child actors, teenagers, and adults, which for someone to lead a film, you're gonna, he's going to need to be able to act across not only just actors, but people of different ages and different backgrounds, which I believe he can do. I mean, just alone, his back and forth between the actor who plays Dustin in Stranger Things is a great exchange. His back and forth with... Um, uh, the the, the uh, Uma Thurman's daughter in season three is in, is very good, and not and uh, actually I don't want to spoil season four. But to speak with Oscar Isaac though, he list Alex listed a lot of projects he's a part of. At this point, Oscar Isaac he's probably more interested in putting more projects together than wanting to put all that aside and be the lead of a franchise that's going to be produced by Tom Cruise. Because uh, honestly, Oscar Isaac, I think he would personally more enjoy doing solo character pieces like Inside Lewin Davis or A Most Violent Year than he would want to be an action time. All right, we're going to go ahead and get into the open discussion. Four minutes on the clock when the first person speaks. Ryan, I've got a real issue with what you said about Tom Cruise, who, again, I'm not a fan of. Terrible, <laughs> terrible, awful. But one thing that you said is that Tom Cruise has had a bit of a career. By the time that Tom Cruise started in, Mission, in, the, in the Mission Impossible franchise, he'd had a best actor nomination at the academy awards so like comparing an early rise of a career to joe Ke like an early tom cruise to let's say early joe keery is a yeah. bit of a stretch tom cruise was way more accomplished uh at the at that point of his career but when starting mission impossible than joe keery was 
Do you think, tell me right the second, right now, do you think if Joe Keery wanted to produce anything, anything significant that we would ever see, do you think a studio would right now let him do it? Obviously, it's a rhetorical question because the answer is no, because he's only, because right now he's an actor. And I do agree with you. I did, the uh, reason why I put those, I stated those differences was because, I, I, I reason why I stated those differences between Cruz and Kiri, not just to show the differences of ages, but it's also it's also just to show that just because Cruz had these ten, these huge tenfold films behind his back still meant that the first Mission Impossible could not have been a success, honestly. And I recall Tom Cruise when he was played the role of Ethan Hunt, and of course many people were kind of angry that he was been chosen as lead over a character because this was a film that's based off of a tv show and when the tv audiences were learning that Cruz was making himself the lead and carrying on forward wasn't very happy with a lot of people now it's still a rhetorical question if joe curie brought a project to a studio he doesn't have there's not much water or much proof but he doesn't have much behind him to get a backing but it doesn't change but it won't change that joe curie has a great following behind him from the Stranger Things audiences in order to bring them aboard to watch the Mission Impossible films. Right. I'm not arguing that Joe Keery doesn't have fans. Joe Keery has, I'm sure, three fans. What I'm saying is that <laughs> Tom Cruise, that. in his current role, produces and acts in, promotes the Mission Impossible franchise, which is something that at least two of the three, the lead of this film franchise, would have to do. And I'll be honest, even if Joe Keery were on David Lett or were on some like prestigious talk show right now, he wouldn't be the main act. He wouldn't be the 15 minute. He wouldn't get three segments. Uh, I mean, whereas Oscar Isaac absolutely would. Oscar Isaac would travel internationally because he speaks a few different languages to promote the movie, which is something that Joe Keery just couldn't do. I would argue not and many American I think, actors are able to speak a lot of languages and dwell while going on press. So tours. get one that you can. But it doesn't but it shouldn't just be the sole reason. I mean the point the point of this question is who's going to carry the who is going to be the next lead. And from and we know from Hollywood's history, they like to get younger actors or at least actors who are at a certain age they know they can be able to sign on to a, a two or four picture contract. Now, of course, that can fall apart from the first film, but Joe Curie is still alone. He is right at that age to where you can sign him onto a multi-year, a multi-picture deal to work with the Mission Impossible films. Especially, we've spent over 10 years following an older Ethan Hunt. The change perspective of maybe having Ethan Hunt be a mentor to a new person, uh, to a younger agent, is still a good sign there. It doesn't, it doesn't mean we're going to be losing Tom Cruise. It, we could just mean that Tom Cruise is just going to re is just going to reduce his time on screen just so we can have more younger actors. I mean, we saw that with Top Gun Maverick. Well, sure, he was still on the main, he was still part of the main picture, but the younger actors were able to were able to still shine. Although the question, as stated, and it's floating down below, retires yeah. when Tom Cruise is done with this franchise. Who could take it up? Could it be Joe Keery? I would argue not. I would actually say Oscar Isaac. And time. All right, we're going to go into the one-minute closings. Alex, you are up first on this one. Time starts when you begin speaking. Once again, Ryan would have you believe that Joe Keery is some up-and-coming uh, talent, some uh, prospects that we are just waiting for the crit right critical moment to strike. I would argue right now is a time to strike. He's at peak popularity, and he was when they made Spree, and nobody saw it. Now, maybe enough people didn't switch over their Disney Plus accounts to ha also include Hulu. Maybe the extra $5 was too much. Not sure. What I do know is that Star Wars makes a lot of money. What I do know is that uh, uh, the next Spider-Verse movie is probably going to make a lot of money. What I do know is that you know what studios love? Making a lot of money. Uh, and again, just to rehash an old argument, the list, the A list, the B list, the C list, those are all real things. And again... I have to believe that Oscar Isaac would see a Mission Impossible script appear in his hand before Joe Keery. And to be frank and to be honest, Oscar Isaac is more of a lead than Joe Keery, who, quite frankly, is not Ethan Hunt. The man is Benji. All right, and that is time. We're going to go over to Ryan. You have the final minute of the round, sir.
If he was going to be, I don't think Tom Cruise is going to let anyone else be Ethan Hunt. I'm thinking of Joe Curry being a new character in this franchise. And as far as Oscar Isaac goes, possibly I could see him in a Mission Impossible film as a supporting character or probably in a role like Henry Cavill, Jeremy Renner's. I don't see him as someone who will lead because, as I stated earlier, I think he would be more interested in putting together projects which are good characters like Most Violent Year, like... Uh, inside Lewin Davis, like the card counter to where he is playing someone who is not focused too much on action scenes, more of the action of the conflict at hand. And you, Star Wars, he did, it, it's been coming out later on in interviews that he was not a fan of his experiences during the, during the Star Wars process. He did Moon Knight because he saw something that can be, that he can work as a character, less action involved. So if he's going to switch on to Mission Impossible, He's someone who'd rather do more character pieces, actually make it a spy film instead of the more action-oriented uh, scenes that Tom Cruise has done with the franchise. And time. All right, guys, another really, really good round there. I'm going to go ahead and sit you both in the back while I bring our judges in uh, for the deliberation. Uh, but first, I do have a couple of fact checks, things I looked up. Uh, so first off, it was brought up uh, the ages of the actors since we did it last time as well. For what it's worth, uh, Oscar Isaac is currently 43 years old. Joe Keery, as said, was 30. Uh, in terms of Oscar Isaac's rise, uh, there really isn't. Uh, he, I feel like he has one of the had one of the best rises of an actor over the last 10 years. If you just look at the movies he had done, uh, if we go back 10 years back to 2012. Funny enough, I referenced it. Oscar Isaac actually did have a bit part in the Bourne Legacy. Uh, he had he's had a string of uh, smaller Oscar-driven films inside Lewin Davis, The Most Violent Year, the biggest one probably being Ex Machina, right leading up to Star Wars: The Force Awakens, which obviously itself had two sequels, both of which he was a prominent part in. That led to him taking part in some more blockbuster films, including X Men Apocalypse, as well as taking on a cameo in Spider Man Into the Spider Verse. Uh, which would lead to the sequel. He was in the film Triple Frontier, which went to Netflix. Uh, he was in the film Annihilation, once again with Alex Garland. Uh, and my favorite on here, not because it's a good movie, but because I forgot he was in it, but he's in both Adam's Family movies. And if you didn't see those, you missed absolutely nothing. Uh, with that said, uh, the actress you were looking for, who is the daughter of both Uma Thurman and Ethan Hawke, is Maya Hawke. Uh, when comparing Tom Cruise and Joe Keery to the points of their career right now, uh, according to sources I could find, Joe Keery's career began in 2015, which means he has been around for seven years. So if you look at the first seven years of Tom Cruise's career, uh, which began in 1981 and would run to 1987, he didn't quite have that Oscar nomination yet. However, he did have a number of financial hits, including being a part of the ensemble of The Outsiders and starring in the likes of Risky Business, Top Gun, and Rain Man. Uh, as well as the Martin Scorsese film, The Color of Money. Uh, that nomination would come two years after that in uh, 1990 for Born on the Fourth of July. Uh, how, and then the last thing brought up was the number of fans Joe Keery has. Uh, I could not find a strict number uh, because I don't want to go that deep into the web. Teenage girls do weird things, and I'm just not trying to find that right now. Uh, but with that said, we're going to talk about who should lead the franchise. Brian, I go to you based on what was said. Who gets your vote? For me, uh, going with Alex, Alex on this one, what sold me was the point of how he's able to, to do different languages and go to different talk shows. And you mentioned like he's more well known with, and uh, with why he didn't really talk, didn't really mention how, how he'll be. He mentioned more of a character. For me, Alex, Alex is, is the game at point. Okay. Malcolm, down to you, sir. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Um, yeah, I'm also going to go to Alex on this. Like, I heard a lot more from Alex as to why Oscar Isaac would be good to take over the role of um, Evan Hunt in Mission Impossible. And, um, he also said a lot about why Joe really doesn't have that career behind him yet for why he shouldn't take. Um, so, yeah, Alex gets my vote here. All right. Well, judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit you guys in the back because your winner by the final score of three to one, Alex Martinez coming out big with the win, sir. And it's like I said, you keep yourself in good company and that's probably because you're just as good as them. That's a big first win. Uh, against somebody, I believe, if I'm correct, this is at least your first time doing this with me. It may be your first time in general. I'm not 100% sure of everyone's histories. 
Uh, but Ryan does have a little bit of experience, and while I do think he put up a great fight today, it says something to get the win out of this. How are you feeling? Uh, great. Ryan is the man. I don't tend to do a whole lot of debate. Uh, I don't. I think this is the first time I've done it, at least for for internet purposes. Uh, I do love arguing. I'm great at that. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's mostly you know real life smarmy talk. Um, yeah, I had a great time. Ryan is the absolute man. That is why I reached out to him to be. Uh, uh, the latest in a series of teams partners that I hope uh, accomplish something, anything, literally. Um, yeah, uh, so one down, on to the next. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, at the moment, because the schedule is looking a little tight, I don't know if we'll be able to get you one sooner than later. But uh, Battleground has a tradition in the past when I ran it years ago when people took over for me of doing some kind of uh, end of year tournament for usually the top 16 players. It's a thing that happens a lot in different fan leagues and Battleground was no different. Uh, I'm playing with the idea of probably doing something like that this year. And even if we don't get you another match at 1-0, that would certainly put you in the discussion for getting into that. So would that interest you in returning for that or kind of what's your feeling there? Oh, yeah, totally. I'm down to do any show, anytime, always. If I'm awake, I'm available. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, sign me up or don't. It's fine, probably. I've got other stuff. I think about, I think about movies pretty much 24-7 because that's how my life has turned out. Uh, so if you need me, I'll be there. All right. Well, you'll certainly hear from me on that down the road. Thank you, sir, for being here. I look forward to it, and we will see you next time that you are back as I bring in your opponent, Ryan, a, a very admirable performance man. Uh, again, uh, I don't think there's any shame in basically losing the same question twice. That's partially on me. Uh, but you did bring a solid performance for your official debut after those exhibitions. How are you feeling? Well, I did say today my my main goal was just focus on just being calm and trying to get my point across. Um, I do believe I was able to do that. Stumbles on the way, obviously, but you know when it comes with those two questions, it's really like focused on trying to do like I was trying to set up as if I'm trying to pitch something. Uh, that that strategy may have not paid off, but you know it's all fine and indeed. it's indeed. I mean, the, the point of these debates is really to just. Talk and uh, I knew Alex was a great talker. I know he's a good debater. I've seen, I, well, maybe not on here, but I've seen. I know how well he could, he debates when he's you know talking movies. So I so it was going to be exactly what I, I was expecting. A very challenging and a very up uh, yeah challenging. I'm trying to uplifting battle, but I don't feel uplifted at this moment. I'm uplifted the fact that Alex won. It's just <laughs> the fact that I lost. But either way. I'm glad that, you know, doing this, hopefully doing more of these, I'll be bad in shape like I was a couple of years ago when I was part of this stuff. But either way, I'm here just for the fun of debating and movies. Yeah, absolutely. Or any other subject, said, not just movies. <laughs> <laughs> right, right now, uh, there's nothing on the books for you uh, just because your debut kind of got pushed into everybody else getting a next match. Uh, yeah. But certainly as soon as we can get you back in, we, we have a couple of other 0-1 players. We have some players that are on uh, the losing side of the record there. So I'm sure we'll definitely find somebody for you to play. That wasn't meant to be personal. You're 0-1. It's okay. It could get worse. Uh, we will see in the future. But it was great having you, man. Welcome back to the battleground, and we will see you next time that you are here. Take care, man. Thank you. All right, guys, and that is another Battleground match in the books. If you guys are here still, thank you guys so much for watching. I want to say again, congratulations to Alex, a great performance, to Ryan. I want to thank my judges, Malcolm, Stacy, and Brian for being here with us tonight and making the show happen. Without them, we literally couldn't do this because nobody wants to see me judge these again at all. Nobody. Go watch them. They're bad. Uh, thank you guys again. Uh, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, like, rate the video, drop a comment on your thoughts, and stick around to see these guys and more re-enter the movie Battleground. Uh, every Saturday, we have our Summer Invitational Tournament. Ten players entered the Battleground uh, by way of semi-random selection slash prize for participation, uh, and one of them is going to win this tournament. So tune in every Saturday to check that out, in addition to all the matches we have going up every single week. With that said, my name is Aaron Canole. And we'll see you next time on the movie battleground. Take care.